Hi there, welcome. My name is Pam Byers, and you have just seen the trailer of Gerald Dickens' One Man Show of a Christmas Carol. Byers' Choice, we make the Christmas Caroler figurines, but most importantly and most meaningfully this time of year, we get to host Gerald Dickens at our facility and also help him to plan his U.S. tour uh, of his One Man Show of a Christmas Carol. Because we can't have that in person this year, Gerald has generously made this amazing film for us to enjoy. And Gerald is joining us from just off the stage in Liverpool, England. And I'm here in Pennsylvania where we make the carolers. Gerald, how are you tonight? Oh, very good. Very good. It was wonderful to have the opportunity to perform on this very, very special day. Um, there haven't been many performances this year, but uh, it, it was great to be on stage today. Now, this is December 19th, 2020. What is special yeah. about December 19th? Well, December 19th is, is the very date on which Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol in 1843, 177 years ago. Um, and it's, you know, one of the most important dates in, in literary history from that point of view. He wrote A Christmas Carol unbelievably quickly. He, he had the idea at the beginning of October of that year of 1843. He was campaigning vigorously on behalf of the children of workers, um, children of people who were not wealthy enough to give them a good education and, and a whole generation was being lost. And Dickens really felt this very, very important issue. Um, he, of course, had suffered himself in childhood. He had worked in a factory because his father was in debt. So this was something that meant a lot to him. But it was while he was making a speech uh, in Manchester, a city not far from where I am now, that he suddenly thought, I can do so much more rather than just giving speeches and writing political pamphlets. If I can cash in on my popularity as an author and write a special book for Christmas that deals with these issues, then that's going to get into many more homes, get into many more um, minds than, than just by campaigning. So he immediately started writing A Christmas Carol and was flat out. He wrote it constantly. And he, he said in a letter later that he cried and he laughed and he cried again while he was writing it. And he would be performing dialogue to himself as he was on long um, nighttime walks. It was an amazing piece of work. And in the end, the publishers threw their hands up and said, we're not interested in this project because Dickens wanted it to be special. He wanted it to be a, a gift to his readers. So the, the the production values of the book were going to be huge. There were gold edges to the papers and all the illustrations were hand watercolor, um, watercolor pieces. Um, beautiful, beautiful bit of production. But it had to sell cheaply. And that's when the publisher said, not a chance. So Dickens then just said, all right, I will fund it. I'll self-publish it. You know, if you can produce it, I'll pay for the whole lot. And, and that's how A Christmas Carol came about in 1843. And, and it's never been out of print since. And one of the most popular novels ever written. And I, I've got a huge amount to, to thank it for, for what I've been able to do over the years. You know, I've been performing it as a one-man show in, uh, since 1993, the 150th anniversary of the publication. So it's a very special day for me. Very nice. Well, we have a lot of uh, questions coming in. So people are um, giving their comments through the okay. live stream. So why don't we go to some questions? Uh, the first one's from Samantha. She asked, was the creation of the incredible characters from A Christmas Carol inspired by real people that Charles Dickens had actually met or knew? And how did he create these characters in general and, and <clears> give them their names? I, I don't think his characters were based on anyone absolutely specific. I don't think you can say there was a Scrooge or there was a Fezziwig. Oh, please, I wish there was a Fezziwig. We need a Fezziwig now, don't we? Um, but he, he created his characters as, as an amalgam of different people he knew and he saw. He was a great observer. He, he watched. He learned. He was a great, um, he, he soaked character up. At his basis, Dickens was a theatre man. Uh, he loved theatre, and, and 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 that's what you do. You watch people, you you study people, you you take things on board. So the, the characters came out of that. In, in in living in London, there would have been hard nosed businessmen. There would have been downtrodden clerks who who felt they should have been paid more and wanted to spend more time with their family. Um, so all of the characters were around him. Um, 
Of, of course, the character of Scrooge he'd used once before. He 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 had told a story in the Pickwick Papers um, about a, a, an evil grave digger called Gabriel Grubb, and that's where the basis of a Christmas Carol came from. Uh, a few years before, as for the names, he worked long and hard to get the names right. Uh, they were very important to him to 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 create a character. The second you read of them, you knew what you were getting. Um, so again, the same way he collected characters, he collected names, he watched, he looked, he needed a sound. I've noticed that quite often good characters in Dickens have multiple syllable names like Fezziwig, um, whereas the villains have single syllable names like Quilp. So in Ebenezer Scrooge, you have got both. You've got a multi-syllable um, name as his first name and boom, hard single syllable name as his second name. And that's perfect for the character. He changes from, from being uh, a bad character to a very good one at the end. That's quite an interesting observation. Um, <laughs> do you have a favorite character? You mentioned Fezziwig, but when you're performing A Christmas Carol, there's well, someone that really it, stick out? Kind of a bit of a dull answer really, but the, the, the favorite character to perform is is scrooge because um he's the only one in the story that undergoes a process of change throughout the whole time um so you have to see that you have to see that gentle change from the very first visit by the ghost of christmas past right up to the the, the, the morning when he reawakens and and he has to be recognizably the same character throughout it makes no sense if he's just evil evil hard nasty evil hardy oh suddenly he's great that doesn't work that there have to be parts of the good Scrooge at the beginning and there have to be still parts of the hard Scrooge at the end for, for, for the whole story to work. Yeah. Well, let's go on. I think we have another question um, coming up from Carol Ann. She says that I have several books of the story A Christmas Carol, but mm -hmm. one of my most treasured was published in 1902, which my husband brought me one Christmas from a bookshop in New York. Wow. What is your most treasured edition or copy of the book? <sighs> You know, I I don't have any really old copies. Your, your copy is much older than anything I've got. Um, you know, I'd love to say I have a first edition on my shelves, which I treasure above all else. And uh, Sadly, I don't. If anyone wishes to donate about £80,000 to me, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to purchase a, a first edition on your behalf. But um, probably the most special one I've got actually isn't a, a complete edition. It's It, it was a, an edition published in 1969 called a reading edition. And it was the one that I very first used, my very first reading of A Christmas Carol in, in 1993. Um, it's not a particularly good edit, actually. Uh, there are much better abridged versions, but because it was the one I used for my very first show, that's the most important one to me. Oh, nice. So I think we have some more questions coming in as well. Um, from, there's one here from Marsha. Says, did anyone ever call Charles Dickens Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> Probably just the one. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I, I've never heard that. But his elder son was Charles, and he was known as Charles Junior or Charlie. Um, he was often referred to as Charlie. So, so that was the Charlie in the family. I've never heard Charles Dickens himself being called Charlie. Okay. Uh, from Nathaniel, um, what do you think Dickens? would make of the ongoing popularity so long after he wrote it? What would you think of that today? It's a kind of a funny question to think about. <laughs> uh, you get inside Dickens' head a lot. Study his Tell banker's book. <laughs> Charles Dickens would be delighted, and he'd be delighted on, on two counts. As an author and a performer and an actor, to know this popularity is still going 177 years after he wrote it would just, oh, he would be so excited by that. But also A Christmas Carol was written for a very specific reason and that was to deal with very specific issues. And those issues are just as relevant today as they were when he wrote it. And that would sadden him. That would sadden him a great deal. That one of the reasons that we still devour A Christmas Carol is because the lessons it teaches still haven't fully been learned. So, you know, there might be a conflict in his in his response, but I, I think the the overriding one would be absolute delight and pleasure and excitement, and and probably a slight sense of disbelief. <laughs> um, this one says, "How easy was it to take your stage performance and direct this film performance?" I was particularly impressed by the wonderful settings that you found, the graveyard, yeah. the buildings. 
How hmm. have you felt with that to direct yourself in this production? Well, the first thing to say about that is that I have no background in filmmaking whatsoever. I've, I've never done anything like this before. So it was a complete learning process for me. Um, <clears throat> I took the script as a central script. That, that, that was the first thing, the script I've always used. Um, so, so I was very familiar with that. I was very familiar with the, the storytelling aspect of it. I wasn't going to get lost if we were filming out of sequence, which we were. A lot of the ideas for the filming then came out of the locations we, we chose. Um, the first one was that, that churchyard that we use for a lot of the narrative. Um, and that is actually the churchyard that features in the, the opening sequence of Great Expectations. So that features in a Dickens novel. Um, and, and that was exciting. And then we found the, 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 the pathway behind the churchyard, which we use for that closing shot as, as the narrator walks off into the sunset, saying, God bless us, everyone. Um, so we kind of built around that and chose different places around the churchyard to do different areas of narrative. So, so there was a slight confusion. The, the, the whole thing with the Christmas Carol is it's playing with time. You don't never quite know where you are. And, and I wanted to capture that. So one moment I wanted a narrator in one place and then a different place and then the scene happening somewhere. The next location we came on to was the, the crypt at Rochester Cathedral with all those wonderful arches and strange lighting. And I wanted to use that as a sort of image of Scrooge's mind, of his memory. It's all a bit confused. So those scenes in the past never go out onto location. They're all hidden away in this, this sort of tomb-like crypt that is his mind. Um, the great thing about the directing of the film was working with Emily Walder, who was the, 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 the videographer and the editor. And as soon as we met on the first day of filming, she just got it. She, she knew what I was trying to do. So I, I knew what she was doing with the camera and, and, and how she was playing about would, would back up what I was trying to do. So we really worked as a very good team over that time. And we learned a lot. I think people might be intrigued enough to think about where they can find this right now. Where could they find this movie? Well, um, it, it, it's available to rent at the moment on the Vimeo platform, but the, the best way to access it is through my own website, um, that's GeraldDickens.com. And you rent it for seven days, you can watch it as many times as you like, um, but also there's a feature there where you can, you can gift it. So, so when you get to the, the rental page, you can, you can decide to, to gift it to someone, put an email in and then send it as, as a Christmas gift. Um, so it, 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 it's a great thing and, and it's there up until 31st of December. Or December so, 31st, if, if I'm speaking American. <laughs> so yeah, speaking of movies, we have The Man Who Invented Christmas, which, mm -hmm. I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, suggests that, that Charles Dickens basically invented Christmas with a, with a more <laughs> modern idea of Christmas, like how we might yeah. think of it. Uh, is there any truth to this movie, Ryan asked, The Man Who Invented Christmas? I, actually, there's quite a lot of truth in it. Um, a, a lot of things that happen in The Man Who Invented Christmas uh, actually happened in, in, in Dickens' life. The only thing is, it's all been squashed into a single two-week period. Um, that wasn't the case. But his father was feckless. Um, his father did cut off Dickens' autographs off the bottom of letters and, and try to sell them. Um, that, that, that's mentioned in the movie, and, and that happened. Um, Dickens did have a pet, pet raven flying around called Grip. Um, that happened in the movie. So the, a, a lot of it is true. Did Dickens invent Christmas? No, he didn't. Um, but he popularized it. Christmas was undergoing a, a major process of change at, at that time. Uh, the, the first Christmas card was published in 1843, the same year as A Christmas Carol. Prince Albert was bringing Germanic um, Christmas traditions in, into Buckingham Palace and bringing trees inside and the exchanging of gifts. And Dickens was on hand to capture that and report it in, in that brilliant way he did. And there are some beautiful short stories about Christmas in sketches by Boz and in Pickwick Papers and some of his other works um, that, that just build on what we know from A Christmas Carol. So no, he didn't invent Christmas, but he, he certainly gave us an idea of, of, of a Victorian Christmas. Um, yeah, I have a question about, you know, right now, of course, it's Christmas Carol is wildly popular. We all know the story. How was it received at the time when it was published? Did, oh. Was it a hit right away? Yeah, instant hit, instant hit. It was published on this day 177 years ago. Um, I think the first run was 6,000 copies, sold out almost instantly. It, 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 it was reprinted and reprinted and reprinted. Um, 
and well, it's never been out of print but yes it's sold instantly and and mostly to critical acclaim some of the literary critics didn't like it so much but um on the whole and, and the, the public the readership adored it and couldn't get enough of it um and when dickens started performing his his readings uh, about 10 years later Christmas Carol was what he went to. He he knew it was popular. He knew it would sell. So a Christmas Carol was the one he he went back to as a performance. Now here here in Pennsylvania, um, the middle schoolers tend it tends to be part of the school curriculum to mm -hmm. read a Christmas Carol, yeah. and it's quite popular um, here. And I was wondering, and I know you've spoken to school groups here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Is it the same in the U.K.? Uh, do children read this as part of their curriculum there, and yeah. how is it? How is it taught? Is there a difference or similarity there? Actually, over the last few years, A Christmas Carol has come back onto the curriculum and is being studied um, for, for exam level, um, the, the, the exams over here at GCSEs. And yeah, it, it, it's been very popular. And I've been going into a lot of schools over the last few years um, talking about it. And it's one, one of the things I really want to do with the movie, actually, is, is get it out to the schools next year. Um, and then follow up with kind of Zoom Q&A sessions um, about the text, about the history, about my adaptation of it, um, to open it as a, as a discussion. So yeah, it, it, it's very popular over here again now. Yeah. And then the other thing I always want to know when I, we've talked about this before, but being a direct descendant of Charles Dickens, do you always kind of envision yourself being sort of a part of this world? Or did you say, oh, I don't know if that's really for me. How did it come about really? As a young actor, as a young actor, I I purposefully avoided having anything to do with Charles Dickens. I I, I made a conscious decision to distance myself from, from associating myself with kind of what I saw as a bit of a circus at the time. Um, what I hadn't appreciated was was this circus was generated out of sheer passion and and love for for what he he wrote and achieved. My my first real connection, if you like, with Dickens, the first time I really understood it and got it, was in 1980 um, when, as part of the family, I went to see a production of Nicholas Nickleby, which was staged by the Royal Shakespeare Company in Britain at that time. And we, as a family, were invited to go and see it on New Year's Eve. Now, the show was eight hours long. You know, I was late teens, early 20s. I didn't want to be watching Dickens for eight hours on New Year's Eve. Trust me, I wanted to be somewhere else. But I went dutifully along. And the show started. And within five minutes, I was hooked i loved it it was so theatrical and that was my background it was so exciting the the, the storytelling and the characterization and the, and the the stage setting and everything i just was blown away by it and that's when i began to realize there was so much more to dickens than i'd imagined before um and i immediately went back and started rereading books um nicholas nickleby oliver twist um oliver twist i'd had as a book at school uh, which i'd hated and never finished um and, and many of the other books. And that's when I really realized, um, I, I still didn't do anything with it theatrically um, for another 10 years or so, 93, as I said. And even then it wasn't my idea. I, I was asked to do a reading in aid of charity to celebrate the 150th anniversary of A Christmas Carol. And I, I agreed to do it because it was a charitable event. Um, but as soon as I started, and as soon as I discovered this incredible script, because that's what it was, I was just, completely taken and, and couldn't get enough of it you know those characters squeezing wrenching grasping scraping clutching covetous old sinner ah, hard and sharp as you can't help but be my character i remember one of the bits of advice my dad gave me very early on he, he said don't worry charles dickens has done all the work for you and he's so right it's all there laid out so yeah that's kind of how i came you know, came to be part of this and uh, became a born again dickens hallelujah so yeah, we have another question here. Um, is there a movie depiction uh, or version, uh, aside from your own, that you feel is closest <laughs> to the original feeling? I'm kind of biased. I love your show so yeah, much. Yeah. But tell, us about, tell us about the particular ones that you like, the adaptations. You know, I, 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 I was about to say, go to GeraldDickens.com and push the rental button. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, 
Well, do you know, the, the, let, let's approach it from the other direction. There isn't a single movie version I've seen of A Christmas Carol that I've liked. They all have something to them. And the reason for that is the story always wins. The story always comes through. So going from that viewpoint, the ones I really like are ones that bring something different. Now, um, I love the Alistair Sim version. It's, it's a classic telling. And funnily enough, I had two shows today here in Liverpool. And coming up to my hotel room after the first one, I put on the TV. What was there? Alistair Sim Carol. So I watched the end of that. Um, yeah, it's just joyous. It's lovely. It's a beautiful, beautiful version of the film. You, you can't go wrong with it. I also love George C. Scott as Scrooge. Um, he plays Scrooge in a different way. He's big, he's powerful, he's a businessman. Ebenezer Scrooge had an office just behind the Bank of England, just next to the Stock Exchange in, in, in the most affluent part of the city of London. Of course, he was a good businessman. He wasn't a pathetic little weaselly moneylender. He was big, he was powerful. And that's how George C. Scott played him. And, and I love that interpretation. Um, I enjoyed that. And people always think, I'm making a joke when I say this, but I love the Muppets version. I really, really do. It's a very genuine telling of A Christmas Carol. And it uses, but one of the reasons I think it works is because it uses the device of having a narrator talking directly to the camera in in the figure of Rizzo Rat and, and, and um, Greg Gonzo, but that they are narrating directly to us as readers. And that's something that happens in the book. The narrator in the book is very personal. It's as if he's sitting next to you telling a story and occasionally he just points out things. There's that lovely line at the beginning where he says Marley was dead as a doornail. What is dead about a doornail? I don't know. Do you know? I don't. Anyway, let's go back to the story. So there's that, that feeling of a narrator talking directly to you in the book. And the Muppets gets that. And funnily enough, that was something I wanted to do in, in, in my version was have that narrator talking directly to the camera, being very personal to the viewer, because that's how the book is. So those are the three I, I, I really like. Yeah, I've really enjoyed that as well. The fact that you're the narrator as well as the characters, because I felt that spoke to me and drew me in further into the story when you became the narrator. Um, and somebody is asking mm -hmm. here that you. they're finding their, their your performance is really inspiring in this in this film, um, making it really worth watching. What section was your favorite to perform, or perhaps even what section was your more, most challenging to perform? Um, do you know, in the, in, in the film version, it, I, I love doing the, the, I love doing the very emotional pieces, um, but Bob Cratchit, when he's breaking down, um, he, he's trying to be stoic, he's, he's trying to be strong for his family, and, and then he just breaks down, and, and, you know, on a stage with, with 800 people watching, you know, when we perform it by his choice, it's a huge venue, so I, I can't do small things but when the camera is just there you, you can just crumple and, and you can sort of do that and and, and that's a, a, a really amazing thing to be able to do i love the scenes in the churchyard with the ghost um of christmas yet to come walking through with his finger pointing and i, I love what emily did with that um from an editing point of view um so so, so those parts the, the very dramatic and the and the and, and, and the emotional parts, uh, I think, are the ones I really enjoyed doing. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting the way that you adapted it, because, of course, when you're on stage with Byron's Choice, it's big, big, big. Yeah. But obviously, yeah. on, on the small screen, you might look a little crazy, actually, <laughs> being that big. <laughs> but I love the way that we could really see your emotions. You know, I'm used to seeing you more a little bit. Usually, I'm in the back of the room. Yeah, but it, yeah, you know, but I, you know, I love seeing, I love seeing your emotions yeah. up close. It was really, really a special, special experience for us. Yeah. And I'm sure the one that will enjoy it, it again. Was fun, it was fun to be able to play that a little more. Yeah. 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 Um, Elaine asks, have you ever seen the musical version of A Christmas Carol? Um, well, there's, there's the, the, the movie, the, the movie musical with, um, Albert Finney, um, yeah, you've seen that many, many times, which I love as well, actually. Um, that, that's, that, that's great fun. And I've seen it a few times on stage, various musical versions of it. Um, when, when I've been touring in America, a lot of um, places invite me to go and watch um, 
a version and that's always fun um so yeah and and the lovely thing about a christmas carol i find is that it lends itself to any form of performance so you can do it as a big musical with big dance pieces and lots of colorful costumes and a big orchestra and fantastically scored songs you can do it as a one man performance like i do it you can do it even smaller as a one man reading it works as an audiobook it works animated it works with muppets it works with mr magoo it works with anyone um you know it's just such an incredible story that that it works in every format and and they all work so so yeah we um are really missing this this particular format that we've come to love the one that you perform at virus stories for us yeah, and yeah. we do have you know so many disappointed people as a matter of fact tonight we're still we're still soliciting questions if anybody has them but we're getting a lot of greetings for you the fans really miss <laughs> nice. you um, nice. there were Thank a you. lot of disappointed you know a lot of disappointed um people <laughs> this year and I, I have to say the one thing that i've noticed that you've been coming to virus choice for many years and um you know, I run your greeter line, like when people want to come in and say hello and get a photo with you. Yeah. Um, I meet so many people and you really, they feel like friends. Um, you've made yeah. so many friends. That, that, that's been, that, that really has been a case that, that, that uh, over the years, at every venue I go to, people, People come back and back and back and I know them my name and I know their families and you know when they first came to see the show they had a tiny little baby on their knee and and, and now they come along with a 20 year old in tow and <laughs> that makes you feel good um and it's really special and and you know the the, the venue at Buyer's Choice specifically for people that don't know those those carolers sitting just over Pam's shoulders there the production floor where they're constructed that becomes our theater so so the whole floor is cleared and and 900 seats are put in there and, and Bob Byers always says that he feels like Mr. Fezziwig, you know, clearing out the warehouse on Christmas Eve for our big party. And, and that's how it feels. It's, it's just celebratory. Yeah, it's such a busy, busy time of year for us as we're manufacturing and shipping. But the weekend that you're there, yeah, it's turns into this magical place. We all look forward to it so much. And we are so hopeful that next year you'll be able to come and see us in person. Until then, we do have your yeah. film which maybe you could tell us again where you can find it. Oh, and I just want to add, so, so Buyer's Choice was um, helped facilitate and sponsor the making of the film. And so as well did Mid-Continent Public Library in uh, in and around Kansas City, Missouri. And they've been, yeah. they have been wonderful um, friends of yours for many years. Oh, yeah. Shout out to them for all of their help. Um, Actually, I've been constant. In public library um for every year i've been touring in america um that are my longest venue and they've been very very good friends and, and they helped us a great deal as you say putting this movie together that they, they, they were um really good in facilitating that so um the the, the the movie of christmas carol it's it's up there right now it's available until 31st december um you go to gerald.com and you'll find the, the the link to the rental page uh, and and you can rent it you have it for seven days you can watch as many times as you like you can gift it you can gift it multiple times so send it to everybody i don't even have a digital stocking filler but let's let's do that um and you know and enjoy the movie get get lost in a christmas carol o open a copy of the book and follow the lines because the lines are all taken from the original text and and just have a great christmas enjoying it you know let's let, let's say god bless us everyone to this christmas and bar humbug to 2020 and then let's get on with a, a much better year next year <laughs> So I think we're going to go out with a trailer of the film Great. and um, please, please hey. go to GeraldDickens.com and Merry Christmas to everybody. Rent, rent the film. Merry Christmas, everybody.
Pokémon. Humbug.